It's hard to imagine an event that would define the careers of procurement and supply chain professionals worldwide more than a global pandemic. Yet at the start of a decade, that's exactly what we have. The virus is in every continent except Antarctica. The world's stock markets have hit their lowest point since the global financial crisis. Flights and events are being cancelled every day. 94% of the world's supply chains have been disrupted. Yet from the perspective of the C-suite and our shareholders, business must go on. And we're the ones responsible for making sure that happens. At Procurious, we want to help you crowdsource confidence during the coronavirus crisis. Today's webinar is really a helicopter's view and an understanding of the macro situation. That's why today we've called together our heavy-hitting thought leaders. Let me introduce our incredible guests for today. Let's start with Nick Gowing. For 18 years, Nick was a main news presenter for the BBC's international 24-hour news channel, BBC World News following a previous 18 years at ITN as a Bureau Chief in Rome and Warsaw and Diplomatic Editor for Channel 4 News. In 2016, Nick co-authored Thinking the Unthinkable, a study conducted with hundreds of high-profile senior corporate and public leaders, revealing candidly the factors that explain why so many leaders face new difficulties, identifying disruptions of the new normal that have emerged in recent years. Justin Crump is an Army officer and former investment banker with 25 years full and part-time military service, including operational deployments in the Balkans, Iraq and Afghanistan. He left government service in 2007 to become a director of an international risk advisory firm before founding Cyberline in 2010 in order to bring a new approach to understanding and valuing world risk. He's a recognised expert on corporate security and intelligence work, quite having literally written a book on the topic, and greatly enjoys helping organisations of all sizes make sense of their world. Professor Alinga Tayyid is a council member and expert advisor to the Chinese Ministry of Commerce's China e-commerce blockchain community. He is also head of the EU Procurement Forum's Social Value and Transparency in Supply Chains Group. As part of Jagger's global product management team, Georg Roche, VP Product Management, is responsible for driving innovation and increasing quality across Jagger's solution suite. With more than 20 years of experience working in the procurement software industry, he is an expert in his field and specialises in solving supply management challenges faced by both customers and suppliers. Before beginning his career in product management, he led the development department. What an amazing group of professionals we have here today to address this important topic. In my introduction, I gave a high-level overview of the current situation. To help further set the scene for our listeners, do any of you have some breaking information or insights to share that could help our community better understand the situation? Nick, why don't we start with you? This is a, uh, an enormous set of challenges and I think most people are floored by the enormity of what is happening. We've been working on thinking unthinkables for the last few years, and this is a real unthinkable. It's unpalatable as well. There was a warning of what would happen with uh, an enormous uh, epidemic like this, and it is now, after all, officially a pandemic. Uh, but what we're seeing is really a large number of leaders and those around the world who are simply floored by the enormity of what is happening. There's a, it is an unthinkable set of circumstances, with much worse to come, with enormous implications for everything, particularly in the supply and procurement chains. But it's also a societal threat. I don't think most people understand what adversity is, and therefore what they're facing is significant challenges to all they assume about a normal, balanced um, way of life where, frankly, life tends to get better. Things are going to get much worse, and here in the United Kingdom, certainly the kind of predictions we are getting and forecasting we're getting medically and epidemiologically from the government at the moment uh, are that uh, this is going to be a significant uh, impact on family life, on corporate life, on life as we know it. What a dramatic introduction. Justin, do you share the same views? Yeah, I think in part. Um, I would argue, I mean, obviously it's a, a turn of phrase of the unthinkable. I mean, I think this was thinkable. I mean, pandemic planning has, has long been on the horizon 
Um, you know, we've seen this roughly once every 10 years. There was a lot of fuss over H1N1. Um, and again, I think perhaps the fact that that was seen as an overreaction at the time um, may have prompted some slower reactions now. But I mean, as you know, uh, in Procurious events the last couple of years, we've been raising the, the constant risk of a pandemic and partly given a more crowded planet and more crowded environments and cities like Wuhan, you know, that are in these sort of areas where, where things can gestate. You know, this is a known, um, you know, a kind of known issue in a way. So, uh, you know, I think there, there is some option there. There was some planning there. Um, I think China has shown that containment does work. There are costs to it. But, you know, China currently is coming relatively well um, out of what's happened. And if you look at the rate at the time of speaking, um, really, they're, they're has not risen in the last couple of weeks and the big drive has been as we know centered on iran italy um and then the, the cascading consequences but i do agree with nick about the fact that i think in the west in particular we've not been reacting well at the government level i think corporates have actually shown um more responsibility early in terms of instituting work from home and cancelling events and gatherings probably a week or two ahead of where the advice um you know has officially emerged and I think that's that's actually helped in the response. But Western society in general, I think, has not been as amenable to the idea of lockdowns or quarantine or self-discipline as may be seen in China and, and also Korea, where you know they've, they've recovered in a few places. So I do agree with Nick that um, there are some challenges here that I'm not sure that you know we are going to deal with as well as more autocratic um, you know, societies like China has done. But you know, the containment has been shown to work in those instances. It may be far too late, really, to, to save Europe from going the same way as Italy in about a week or two behind. And obviously, it's a fast-moving situation. But we kind of do expect things to at least peak towards uh, the end of the month at best with the UK, rest of Western Europe, and um, indeed the US looking like Italy does now, You know, certainly going into April. And I think you're then that's a sort of better case scenario. We reckon that's about the 50% likely outcome at the moment. Um, but it could go much longer than that. And our 35% outcome is that this takes about a year to get under control. And the economic damage in that um, situation goes on to about 2030. So um, probably not quite as dramatic as Nick, but not far off it. Well, this is a, an action-packed beginning to our discussion today. Alinga, this first question is really just for you to share any big news that you have or a, an insight that our listeners may not have heard. What's happening in your world? Okay, sure. I, I think we have uh, um, a bit of a breaking news that uh, was only released this morning. But to give you a background um, before that, I guess we have a think tank called the Center for Citizenship, Enterprise, and Governance, and it's a not-for-profit and it's quite pedestrian. We've only it's taken us six years, by August, by autumn last year, 2019, to get to just 125,000 members. So it's quite slow. And in that last autumn, we decided to to put a kind of new division, a new foundation called TTP, a Trans Transnational Transparent Procurement Foundation, um, only for procurement. And we suddenly saw our membership jump 40,000 in three months. And we were startled because we were used to much more pedestrian ways. And then normally we are very proactive in reaching out to members and members don't reach us. And although we have something like 7,000 C-suite uh, multinational executives, they rarely communicate unless you ask them. In the last 30 days, we've had over 300 of these guys come to us and say, of multinationals, say that we are looking, we need a solution and we need it fast for this virus condition. And, and in effect, what we had proposed and when we set up this foundation was to use a blockchain a solution and AI and 5G and Internet of Things for procurement as our instruments to change the world. That was the direction we were going. And the blockchain element was only going to be for certification of things like sustainability, anti-bribery, anti-slavery, etc., normal procurement requirements. What they've come to us as of last month and released as of this morning is that they want a coronavirus clearance certificate on the blockchain launched as a procurement supply chain consortium. And this has really shocked us because first they're proactive, 
Secondly, the timescales. We were only anticipating releasing solutions from our consortium in about six months' time. Now we're forced to release this in April. And so all thousand staff hands on deck right now to try and get this done, a coronavirus clearance certificate for the industry, for the world and for the industry as a whole. And uh, we're kind of a, a bit buzzing, a bit frightened, <laughs> a bit excited uh, about what this could mean. Um, and, and to have actually procurement professionals at the forefront of a global problem as opposed to followers. Oh, Linga, you're always so hard on us. Richard, we're always proactive, aren't we, and always on it. Um, and I'll throw to you next, Richard, but um, that's really exciting. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you today, Alinga, was, you know, whether blockchain could offer a solution uh, for situations like this. So, um, you know, maybe we can elaborate a bit more in the conversation. Richard, you're dealing a lot with those very proactive procurement and operations and supply chain professionals. Do you have any breaking news to share or insights that our community may not be aware of from where you sit in the universe? Well, I think that the, the main observation that we have is that the, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, there, there has been a, a very noticeable shift from trying to eliminate the threat of the, um, the pandemic and infections to just the management of this. And, and the implication of that is that there is going to be a a much more sustained uh, impact to, uh, to businesses and to supply chains than may have previously been expected. So for example, if you were sourcing from China, you obviously had a very acute problem when the, this was restricted to China, but now what we're saying is that this is going to go on for months and months. And it's not just a story of China, it's a story of actually your whole supply chain. So I, I think that that that's the shift that people are making at the moment and it's certainly been the topic of uh, conversations with our clients. Georg, you're based right in the centre of Europe. You know, if, if we do move our focus from China, what are some new things that you're hearing um, from the community you work with? Well, I think what is pretty, pretty eminent today is it, it is we we're closer to home than anybody expected, right? I mean, now with schools being closed, um, workers needing to take care of their of their kids, uh, it's not just something that's far away or we have a logistical problem with getting goods in. It's really, we can't produce stuff. Do we have enough resources, meaning both products and people to do things? So I believe um, this is something that um, I haven't experienced. Uh, I mean, when you think about all the, uh, all the things that happened in um, in the recent past, so like um, uh, let's take the example of Fukushima, um, that hit um, some industries quite badly, uh, especially electronics. Um, but this is really overarching what's happening right now, and um, I believe this is the, the the real big thing at the moment. I would say. Mm, yeah, because it could impact even you know everyone and people on the front line producing food. I mean, every sort of product and service we use, it's not just widgets out of China or, or automotive parts from Italy. It, it really is all pervasive. Well, thank you all for sharing that top line news and, and some immediate insights for the, those listeners who've dialed in. Hopefully that's given everyone um, a great sort of insight from around the world on some of the issues. But if we sort of go now back to the helicopter view, you know, this is a global pandemic. Who would have thought this would halt supply chains? All the things Georg and Nick and, and Justin and Richard have been talking about. You know, we're seeing global travel shut down, people not going to work. You know, it's unthinkable for most, but maybe not unthinkable for our very clever panel today, which uh, we've just uh, heard some insights on. Nick, let me bring you back into the conversation. Did you ever anticipate this type of biological outbreak and, and sort of how does this rate on your radar as a black swan? Well, I'm not a medic, but this kind of um, pandemic was predicted and has been signalled for a long time. And I very much agree with what Justin was saying as well. Um, I mean, we can degree, we, we can uh, disagree maybe a little bit on the on the degree of it, but this was predictable. Um, it was a question of when. I don't think, though, that anyone, including 
here in the United Kingdom, the civil contingencies, secretariat, the intelligence services, and others who are meant to be thinking about risk, had really conceptualized what I would classify as a societal slowdown, an implosion of societal links, an implosion of the things we take for granted, whether we're in the developed world, in the highly developed world, or in the developing world. It's the fact that no, most people don't really understand the adversity that they're now about to face, not just on food, but uh, on the fragility of so much that we take for granted because of the level of interlinked nature that there is between everything. And I think uh, the scars of this are going to be much deeper. I would, I would liken this to a wartime now because of the kind of measures that have got to be taken because if people are going uh, to have to look after the kids from school, which means they can't be productive, if people are working at home, it affects the way they think about their work. It affects the relationships they have with people they're meant to be working with. How many people will still have a job at the end of this? How many organizations, how many large corporates will actually be under existential threat or simply have disappeared because they've run out of money? It's this kind of real challenge to the basic assumptions of a society in relative balance, which I think, I hope I'm proved to be wrong, I have to say, but I think the worst case scenario is a real deep scar on everything we take for granted about stability. We've certainly said in all our work in recent months, and certainly at the beginning of this year, 2020, it's a time for 20 slash 20 vision because stability is unraveling. This is going to take an enormous amount of resolve and um, uh, ingenuity, really, and also determination, but all, above all, resilience of people. And I have to say, in the developed world, where people expect that taps will turn on, electricity will be there, food will be in the shops, they can go out and buy stuff, I don't think uh, a large number of people in this developed uh, year of 2020 are, are, are as resilient as they think they are for what is coming down the track. But I pick up one of the things that I think Justin said when we had the last uh, outbreak, certainly in the, here in the United Kingdom with a previous potential epidemic, the predictions were of 65,000 deaths. Well, I think there was something like 474. Um, but this is a different kind of virus. And it's getting into, it's closing down so much. I can tell you because I'm not being invited to conferences. They're all being canceled every day now. Is an empty diary almost because so much is being canceled uh, to the point where you wonder what you're going to be functioning and doing. I've got plenty to do. But a lot of other people I, I know are now, at the, uh, are now rather desperate about how they're going to actually construct a new life around the restrictions, not just of 14 days self-isolation, but maybe much more imposed on them because of this societal implosion. Well, I think you've answered uh, one of my questions later on that's going to be, do you think this is all media hype? But we'll, we'll come no, back to uh, that. Let me tell you, it's not a media hype. I, I yeah. think that's, uh, it's too easy. I, you know, I'm a former television presenter and former journalist for many years. Yes. This is not about the media. This is about mm. the media doing its job properly, which is to communicate what experts, chief medical officers, mm. chief scientific officers, prime ministers and others are saying. And, uh, okay, there's, there's gossip and there's fake news. There's a bit of fake news and some deliberative stuff, which is really quite sinister. But this is where the media comes into its own. And as someone who has reported on a lot of nasty things in this world, uh, I would be considering it my duty to make sure that actually the best information is out there. I now am a person who's consuming information from the media because I'm having to make judgments about, about how I conduct my life. Yes. Alinga, you work closely with China. Was this kind of situation ever in the contingency planning? Um, to understand how China uh, delivers on such, solution, on such uh, situations and how it prepares, you have to uh, slightly uh, uh, take an umbrella look. And this is that China has 1.4 billion people. And so they are geared up to provide data solutions to manage at scale because you can't in, they can't uh, manage it at an individual level. Plus, they have the whole One Belt, BRI, One Belt, One Road initiatives throughout many countries. So they feel they have a very large responsibility. So they are already using 
many large data instruments like DLT, like blockchain for tracking. You know, people nowadays will know that to go to China, you need your fingerprint. Uh, face recognition is now widespread. There's a social credit system. These are all a recognition that they believe data belongs to the government and that they are there to use data to protect uh, and safeguard the people, as opposed to, for example, in you know, the States, data belongs to the corporate, and uh, in Europe, data belongs to uh, us because we believe in Europe you know, is my data, my way. So they're not afraid in China to use data to engineer themselves out of these kind of problems, and they've modeled these things many times over, and that explains the very short data routes to solutions, like lockdowns, movement of people, hospital bills, etc. Because when you have a large amount of data at your disposal, you can model and implement. And that is, I guess, the flip side of the uh, remark that was made by one of my colleagues earlier, that they're autocratic. They consider themselves as using data instruments, which, of course, can break eggs as well. Georg, what role has technology played in helping companies prepare for this type of crisis? Well, first of all, we have to be um, we have to be aware that this is much bigger than technology of what we're facing here. But of course, um, that being said, there is a lot of things where technology can help. And again, technology can always just be an enabler of something. So I don't know um, how often we've evangelized more or less the market uh, that value is so much more important than price. And um, when you think about value correctly, um, it also entails things like risk, like sustainability and all these different kind of things. So um, you have to do a very diligent market screening, I would say, um, where technology is a, is a big enabler um, um, in, in my point of view. And also um, technology helps you when done right so um, that you also have a more active type of risk management, not to do just this firefighting kind of actions, um, but really have a methodology um, behind it that um, enables you to, yeah, to see it holistically uh, and make better decisions. This is what technology should help us do. So I guess to bring you all together on, on the real topic of this webinar, um, the tough question, question is, was this pandemic inevitable? Is this the supply chain crisis we had to have? Nick, this is exactly your kind of question. What are your thoughts? I, well, no one could predict this because no one knew about COVID-19, except there is one sinister element to this. Wuhan apparently is where um, the Chinese have a, a biological weapons research center. And there are rumors that actually some of the animals which were being tested and where potentially things like uh, COVID-19 were being developed, possibly, possibly, um, the animals were being sold on the market, um, having sort of come out of that, um, that uh, facility, that secret facility. And I have no knowledge about this, except that there appears to be some circumstantial evidence. I put that in because uh, I'm not an epidemiolo uh, epidemiologist and I'm not a, a medic. But there, there is a suggestion of how did this first happen. But to answer your question, um, I think you've got to think that this was on a scale and is on a scale that had to be planned for as worst case scenario. And that's what any decent and any good government will do, not try and wing it and hope it'll be much, much easier and less, less uh, impactful. You've got to plan for the worst, like you plan for a nuclear attack. I don't think that this level of contagion has been factored in in a way which probably um, is, is, a, is creating the conditions where it's easy to deal with. I'm not saying there's panic at the moment, but it's, we are certainly at a frontier which was predicted, but no one knew what kind of frontier it would be. I think the scale of and the speed at which it's developed, not helped by the fact that in China for two or three weeks, they actually tried to suppress it, witness the death of, of the young doctor who tried to get the information out and was then uh, essentially blackballed by the Communist Party. 
Um, what you're seeing, of course, is a proliferation, not just in the West and the Western countries and developed world, but the inability of many other nations who have less sophisticated medical systems to, to handle this. Look what's happening in Iran. Look what's happening in Bangladesh now. Look what imminently may happen in India as well, and also in parts of Africa. This is why it is so sinister and potentially uncontrollable. Justin, do you think it's the supply chain crisis or the, the situation that we had to have? It's um, actually, I'd really like to pick up on Nick's earlier point about resilience. And I think, and, and something we've often discussed actually in the Procurious um, sessions I've been in, has been that issue of, of resilience and the fact that there was a sort of an increasing feel that resilience was being given lip service at best. Because we've gone a long time since a major crisis, arguably, or at least a long time in modern terms um, since a, a major crisis. And of course, supply chains are less resilient because we've seen the rise of just in time. Um, we can take the example of car manufacturing where, um, you know, I think DHL, for example, um, are penalized with one of the big manufacturers if they deliver a part um, more than four hours in advance of when it's needed to the factory or, you know, less than 10 minutes uh, in advance when it's needed. And that's their delivery window. So, you know, we're managing on these very fine margins for a lot of things, which really automatically meant um, things weren't resilient. And then, of course, to pick up the other part of people, um, I was asked a lot last year why there wasn't sort of more rioting in the UK about Brexit, and certainly the American perspective of Brexit was that we'd all be tearing each other's heads off in the street. And of course, we did do that in a very British fashion, um, but it didn't involve rioting, really. Um, however, this was also the country that when KFC was not able to get chicken supplies due to a chain supplier, people were legitimately phoning the police um, and insisting that KFC opened because they needed to feed their children. So entirely to Nick's point, I mean, the... Um, the popular resolve and the popular resilience, I think, is lacking. So I, I do think it is beyond supply chain. Um, in a way, supply chain is the easiest thing to cope for. And actually, even within China now, a number of places have already reopened. Manufacturing is continuing and, and things are shipping on. Um, you know, so it shows that this can wash through. But as Nick says, we're going to see peaks. And we're going to see waves of this virus. And I think unless good progress is made towards either reducing lethality or um, vaccination, which of course the great hope is we'll do that this year, then then the consequences will drag on and on. Um, if we do manage to get on top of those things, this is effectively seasonal flu again, and of course that kills many people each year worldwide, but it's a fact of life and we're scaled to deal with it. So yeah, the issue here is the change from this very pleasant, static um, life we've had for you know about 10 years at least, where it's been pretty easy to you know, build out and grow a business, and you know, we've been faced with a challenge that was probably a once in every uh, at this scale 100 years but you know really a pandemic has happened once every 10 years that i've been in corporate security you know and, and so again i think it was um predictable at one level but um, hard to prepare for because people just weren't prepared to prepare for it um because it was too difficult you know and the consequences were too big and it just became easy to say well that will just never happen or if it does we'll wing it um which obviously will be called out not to work and i think the final point i make about this is of course Ten years ago, if I said I was in security, people would understand the physical security, travel, and so on. Um, in the last four or five years, people th automatically think I'm in cyber security because that's where all the focus has gone. And, you know, I hate to say, but I think a lot more businesses are going to go bust as a result of this real virus than we're going to because of computer viruses. So I think we're seeing a very rapid swing back to the fact that mm. actually you need this other sort of security, and it's not just about cyber very tempting to think it was and you know there was a bit of a data problem in dealing with understanding the situation but actually this is real it's back down to people and it's back down to physical security stuff so um it's interesting to see that turn back and uh, that's a point i'd like to leave people with really justin some great points there from the societal changes you know as nick said construct a new life around the constraints which which may include no kfc heaven forbid um, right through to the fact, the DHL example, where, you know, as Georg and Richard, I think, will explain later, uh, we've just got no redundancy in our supply chains anymore. You know, everything is to a razor-thin uh, kind of efficiency level and inventory management, which just means, uh, you know, there's, there's no fat in the system to respond to a change like this. Um, and if I might just, just saying on that one, really, I mean, yes. it's a great point, because... I mean, in a way, the squeezing of that margin that allowed us to have these record corporate profits that were sustained year on year when the global economy probably was weaker than 
the results were suggesting, particularly in the United States, where it didn't really make sense. Um, I think we're now seeing the correction. So the price for that is always going to be paid. It's just it's being paid now with a huge investment rather than maybe as a trickle on people doing business all the time. So I guess one hope might be that actually by sort of ensuring as you go along, then you're able to deal with the peaks and troughs. And we're seeing a massive peak and trough because we didn't invest for that. Why don't we sort of jump ahead um, and try and share some really practical advice um, that we can give to our listeners um, for what they should be doing right now. Um, why don't I, I throw to you, Richard, then Georg. Um, I guess as a quick bit of history, why have we become so China dependent and, and looking at sole suppliers? And, um, you know, maybe if you can also elaborate on just, you know, your advice for what we should be doing right now. So the, the reason that obviously China has become so instrumental in supply chains around the world is just the, the very rapid growth of industry. They, they now account for some 20%, I, I believe, of world GDP and are probably a higher percentage of industrial production. If you're not in China, then you're really not able to draw on the best competitive options for your supply chain. So that, that is sort of the overarching picture here. Now, what we're seeing is a disruption to firstly the supply chain, but I think as I said earlier, this is not just about China anymore. It's not just the China sourcing um, piece, it's also the demand slowdown that you're going to see over a, a sustained period due to the response to this to this virus. So this is a it is a perfect storm, but it's not solely a China story. And what do you think people should be doing right now if they're sitting at the top of a supply chain? What sort of strategies are you advising people to sort of implement? Or you know they're quite practical, I imagine. So in the immediate term, the, the the focus has got to be on business continuity, and and that is purely a a game of understanding what the implications are for your supply chain and what the the highest risks are to your business continuity, and and ensuring that you know if if you do have options at that point to supply from different suppliers, then obviously exploiting those those choices that uh, at the cost that you know it's going to to take. Um, or keeping your, your your business stakeholders, your customers informed that you know that your operations are, are not going to be um, viable for a certain period of time. So you you can see this in in areas that medical supplies is a great example where you know we're we're, on, we're at the point where you you can't actually obtain medical supplies from um, certain certain supply chains. So you you do need to communicate with the public and with um, certain groups of customers. About well, you, you can't can't actually use those, and do you need them? What are the, the mitigating mitigating um, actions that you can take to not need those? So, as an example, here in Australia, the um, the, the the dentists are, are you know not not included in the um, the strategic stockpile for um for for face masks, so they're not going to be able to use them. So, what else can be used if you can't buy them on the market? Georg, what are you seeing in Europe? Um, you know, from a sole sourcing, from sourcing from China, Italy, and uh, do you have any advice for what leaders should be doing right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sole sourcing um, is, of course, a thing. Um, it has multiple reasons. Um, um, when we think about China sourcing, or uh, let's also say low-cost country sourcing, um, it's of course it's the price pressure. Right, so I mean that's that's of course no, number one um, uh, reason why why companies do that, um, but I don't think that's really all. I mean, think about certain technologies. Um, in a lot of in a lot of places, you have um, monopoly kind of situations where you just don't have so many sources you can really go to, or um, you partner with your suppliers, design together with them. So it's it's actually quite cost intensive to build up multiple sources. Um, but even in the automotive industry, not everything comes from China. Um, uh, a lot of automotive companies, they um, have um, some of their supplies on multiple places in the world. So this is what I think what makes this pandemic so problematic um, currently is that it's not located in one place. 
right? So even if you have your um, your supply chains on multiple places on the globe, um, you're still being affected by this. So um, uh, as you just said before, we need more resilience, business continuity. I can uh, also just say that, and we need more redundancies. Actively seek alternatives, be more resilient, and and building more redundancies in the whole system. Which will be, you know, quite a change from our current strategies. Alinga, what are you hearing from your, your peers in China? Um, what are you hearing about um, the supply situation? And do you have any advice for procurement and supply chain leaders right now? Sure, okay. Um, on the uh, on the negative, what I'm hearing from China is that there's a lot. Of, they are very alarmed at the uh, politicizing of supply chains. Um, they they feel at the brunt of uh, a lot of criticism. Uh, I, I hear it on this uh, the webinar, and uh, you know Android being withdrawn from them. Why I was with Huawei uh, directors a couple of days ago, and. Uh, uh, and you know their grand their daughters are being held in you know uh, in the west and they just, uh, but it's a supply chain uh, solution they want but they, you know it's and things like even this travel to europe being banned uh, you know today says to us uh, you know that and the yeah, uk is allowed they say well why you know why are all these things and and supply chains and especially in china why are the politics uh, affecting them and and in general supply chains it should be left out of it it gives them lots of suspicion and risk averse however on the positive i think what they consider are that global problems require global solutions and that there's no longer a place for a discrete single city or single company single country continent solution uh, in this world and that you know, they look at the United Nations SDGs at 2020, and they, they say this is an attempt at uniting the world. And they think the supply chain and procurement need its own non-political contributions towards these SDGs. So this is kind of a huge opportunity for procurement to take leadership position to rescue the world. And you know, I personally welcome the opportunity for supply chain professionals to become heroes in this world. So, you know, one of the um, only... Uh, uh, points that they have done well in China is to use these fourth industrial revolution technologies of uh, blockchain and AI and IoT and 5G as instruments to help change their world. And I think in this uh, uh, highly complex intertwined world, you know, they, they uh, not just they, but the world should look towards this, uh, the 4IR uh, sector as providing some long-term solutions. Very inspirational, Alinga. Thank you. We can be heroes and change the world. Look, we have five minutes to go for this fantastic conversation. So I, I'd like to ask you all a, a quick question about the future, um, just so we can look forward. And, and even though we're in the centre of all of this, try and gain some perspective. Why don't we start with you, Justin? Looking forward... Looking backwards, what are our prospects and, and what's going to change? And I feel like you and Nick have already touched on this, but just maybe some final comments. Yeah, I think what I'd like to pick up on and we've not really discussed is, um, um, well, first of all, to touch on the last point, which is that, you know, politicization. I think a lot of that um, playing field has been set in the last, uh, certainly in the last four years and in the last decade. Um, you know, especially between the U.S. and China. So I think we'll carry on seeing developments in that space for sure, um, you know, catalyzed by this. And I think a lot of the world patterns that Nick's talked about and I've talked about over precarious events in the last few years, you know, these vulnerabilities were there. I think they were hidden. They never quite toppled over. Um, but I think, you know, with this additional level of extreme stress, I think a lot of those global tensions will, will come to the fore. Um, but I think there are some interesting other changes out of this, and one of them I see being environmental. So I think now with less business travel, less flying, um, the pictures coming out of China of, hey, doesn't this place look great without all the industrial pollution? You know, I think some of those things will be um, harnessed by, you know, strong environmental movement that's growing, I think, with good cause. Um, and I think that'll, some of those things coming out of this will be leveraged. Um, so I see a big change around that. I think also patterns of work, and as Nick referred to earlier, of people you know, working from home, what do they do next? I'm already aware of several companies that are actually 
saying we're probably not going to return these people to work, not because we're getting rid of them, but once they're used to working at home, we don't need offices anymore. You know, if we can do this, why do we ever need to get everyone back to the office, commuting, you know, an hour in San Francisco, something like that, you know, when they can be at home? And I think that will start to drive a change in pattern of working we'd started to see, but it hadn't really taken hold. And I think now companies might have the confidence to say, actually, where possible, we're not even going to have people in these expensive parts of the world, you know, commuting to work and spending an hour in traffic. Well, you know, they can live where they want and work remotely. And actually, we've got the confidence because we've had to do it. So the longer this goes on, the more I think companies will, will change how they work, and that'll affect everything we do. Um, I think this has brought that process forward five or ten years. Nick, any closing comments? Yeah, I very much agree with Justin. I think uh, the, these are profound changes coming down the track. It's easy to say we're facing wicked problems. I would say my one significant uh, suggestion is that wicked problems are now the normal. And everyone we're talking about who might be listening to this has got to accept their new vulnerability and not assume it's going to be the way it's been or a slight variation or this is a blip. This is a series of very profound changes. And as Justin has said, it's, it's down to things like, will people be using cars? Will people be traveling? Will people be commuting? Um, we're hearing, for example, that the London transport system is going to be 400 million pounds down because people aren't going to be going to work. I think there's got to be a massive change in mindset and culture. And I leave you with this, that I've just been today with the Director General of the British uh, Confederation of British Industry, Carolyn Fairburn, and she's making it clear that the vast majority of her 190,000 member businesses are, quote, scared. Scared. Mm. That is how leaders now have to understand the challenge they face they've got to think in different ways about unthinkables but as we say it's not just thinking the unthinkable it's thinking the unpalatable unpalatables are there and you've got to identify them and just work with them as opposed to assuming they're going to go away very profound nick richard getting down to the detail of supply chains do you think that this will be a quantum change a long-term change to our supply chains as well I, I think that this will this will reverberate for you know, a very long time, even even if we get through the um, the initial impact of this um, this disturbance on the supply chain, it will be talked about um, in every conversation about you know how to configure supply chains and what what risk to accept and how do we mitigate some of those risks um, for for a generation. You know this is this is. Of the order of um, you know, major international conflict in terms of impact on supply chain, um, they will get back to a semblance of normality. I'm, I'm quite confident of that. But the, the the impact on the individuals and the decisions that are made will last a very long time into the future. Georg, any closing comments from you, and particularly on how technology could help us better manage these crises into the future, but just your closing thoughts. Uh, I can only second what Justin and, and, uh, and Nick and Richard just uh, just said. Uh, I think technology will always play um, a big role in this because it simply makes you faster and more accurate. Um, uh, it helps you gain the visibility that you, um, that you need. But uh, I totally agree. These are really profound changes that will happen. And uh, honestly, if only like one company changes their minds in an e-sourcing event of not deciding by price, but also factoring in, in other things uh, like CSR and like risk, uh, I'm happy. Alinga would we'll leave you, not certainly not for last, but it is last. Alinga, your thoughts? Yes, two sentences. First of all, Tanya, I think to quote you, this is quantum change. I think that was a brilliant uh, phrase to use. You know. We, we are working on solutions with things like the China-Africa Business Council with HMRC on frictionless trade post-Brexit because we don't have 10 years post-Brexit to have agreements. And you know, what it reminds me of is that post-financial crisis of 2008, it was a watershed for, this, for the social innovation space that we used to be in. It changed because it was a crisis for the industry globally. There was no money around and we changed and it's for the better and it revolutionized the industry. I believe that post 2020 will be a watershed for the supply chain industry. It is a quantum change 
and it will ultimately be for good. Thank you so much. Nick, Justin, Richard, Alinga, Georg, absolutely fantastic conversation today on the topic COVID-19, is it the supply chain crisis we have to have? So thank you all listeners for joining us. This will be available for download tomorrow and we look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you.